the brain that's starved isn't able to have this kind of rational discussion and realize that it, it it's killing itself and therefore the, the primary need is to recover the, the the weight and get back to that certain weight point and and since you don't have a willing participant because you can't the brain is completely hijacked uh, the idea is that the child will under the, the direction of the family um be guided towards getting this you know all of that weight gain back which is a very very challenging process. essentially means meant that my husband and I sat for hours and hours on end for every single meal with Atara, which is very hard to imagine. For them, it's like hard to like be dealing with that. But like for me, it's like it's like asking someone to like drink poison. And that's what it felt like every second I had to eat. Like I remember like in the beginning when like I have this like memory of like my dad, you had like a bowl of like Entenmann's donuts. And like 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 the pop them thingies, mm -hmm. and like most people I think would like love to be forced to like eat Entenmann's donuts. <laughs> <But> like <laughs> you like brought them down, and you were like, okay, like here's your like you know like nighttime snack, whatever. And I was like, I was like, and I remember like I was screaming and like running away. Like it felt like poison. Like I was like, I cannot put that in my body. Like I felt like I like I couldn't. Like I was like, how are you making me eat that? Like that. That's how like severe it felt. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Meaningful People Podcast. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming back for another week, another episode. Just a quick trigger warning for this episode. Uh, this might be a sensitive topic for you. We discuss eating disorder and other you know, mental health related topics in this episode, but specifically eating disorders. So just wanted to put that out there. We sat down with Atara Lasky and her parents, Daniel and Connie Herman, incredible people. You'll hear all about it in this episode. I really do think and believe that this episode will help many, many people around the world. So hit that share button and share this episode with a friend. A big thank you to our friends at Albert and Associates for sponsoring this episode of the Meaningful People Podcast. You know what? Moshe can answer the tough questions for you. Hey, you know what? Sh should I be supporting my children right now? Like my financial status? I know you want to, but can you? Are you able to? Uh, should I be taking out another mortgage? Uh, should I be uh, buying that apartment in Israel? These are questions that you might have and you may not know the answer to. And that's why you need to call Moshe Alpert or send them an email. Uh, Moshe studied economics in college and university, but he also knows the Jewish economics, which is super important for you. So that's why you reach out to Moshe Alpert, send them an email at alpertmoshe at gmail.com. That is alpertmoshe at gmail.com. Or give them a call today at 718-644-1594, 718-644-1594. Nine four. I also want to give a big thank you to our friends at Torah Yimusura. You know, they're running this amazing new campaign called Share Hamilas. You have a Rebbe in your life. Maybe it was when you're younger, maybe now, maybe it will be in a couple of years, who knows. But do you have a story, an anecdote, something that when you think about that Rebbe, ah, that was a beautiful, beautiful story. Well, they want to hear that story. They're gathering these stories, the, the rich qualities, the beautiful stories about our mechanchem, mechanos, mora, rebeim, whoever it is in your life. Reach out to Tari Masora and tell them your story. Now, how can you do that? You can do it really simply by calling in the number 718-766-4554 and record your story. You can email sharehamilas at toriumasara.org or you can head to the website sharehamilas.com. All that information, those links will be in the description of this episode. I know myself, I have amazing, amazing rabbi in my life, whether it's Rabbi Pinchas Weinberger, Rabbi Aaron Habertal, Rabbi David Trink of Zatzal. So many rabbi in my life who I've loved, loved, loved. I have so many stories about. And those stories I'll be submitting to Terry Masora. And you should do the same. I also would like to say that this episode has been sponsored by Anonymous. Lezecher Nishmas, her grandmother, Sarah Rachel, Bas Yona, HaKohen, Shpiyas for all the singles to find their Bashert. Now enjoy this episode. You are listening to the Meaningful People Podcast. The podcast featuring our nation's most impactful, influential, and meaningful people. So happy to be joined by Mrs. Herman, Daniel Herman, Atara Lasky. Uh, thank you for joining us for this important conversation. Really, really appreciate it. Um, I think months, years, days after this is aired, I think uh, you guys are going to be known as trailblazers in, in what you're doing and bringing um, a lot of awareness to this topic. Um, I think, you know, the best way to 
get this conversation started, to get this story started, you know, obviously to start from its inception, to start from the beginning. Um, so Tara, if you, if you, if you may, if you could just uh, speak to us, tell us about your story. Sure. Um, so we're from Teaneck, New Jersey. Um, and everything, I know. I have a great family. I love loved everything. Um, so nothing had to do anything with my family or anything that happened later. Um, but just like normal, like middle school anxiety and like insecurity. Like I think every middle school girl feels like very anxious and like about how she looks and like how people think of her. Yeah. Um, so it was kind of like very normal. Um, and there was obviously a breaking point. Um, and that was... I was I always felt like it just like like looked fat, even though like I wasn't. Um, but I just thought I did. Um and I went to a camp. I'm not gonna say the camp, because this is not like a little Shanhara. So <laughs> the the I went to camp and I felt like, very insecure. And f- the first part that was like the unwinding was that I was with a bunch of girls in my bunk and they were they use like they would use the word like anorexic as like a synonym for like mm. skinny, and I, that was the first time I ever heard that word before. And they were talking about that like one of her friends who like just was who's anorexic and she was so skinny and she lost tons of weight and like she looked so good. And I was like, oh, I want to be like that. Like that sounds cool. But I didn't know what that actually meant. And then I went to the nurse in camp to get Advil one day because I was having stomach issues or whatever, and I just wanted Advil. And she asked for my height and weight, so she knew how much to give me. So I told her, and she said to me, that's overweight for your height and age. And in front of, like, the whole line of people behind me, like, staff, like, kids, like, it was, it was like, embarrassing beyond. And, like, wow. I was like, oh, I guess it's true. Like, I guess I am fat. I'm like, by the way, like, I don't know why she said that, because I wasn't even fat. Right. Um, but, like, one person can tell you that, and then you'll believe it. Um, so I was like, oh, like, I guess, like, I was right. Like, I am fat. So that was, like, a starting point of, okay, I'm going to, you know, eat less. I'm going to work out more, whatever. And I start, it started out in camp. Um, I came home and I lost a bunch of weight and I was like, okay, great, it worked. Um, and I thought I could stop. And it, once it started, it can't stop. Um, and it really just kept spiraling. Um, I wanted to tell my parents a few times. There was, I remember there was like two times where I wanted to yeah. tell you. There was one time I wanted, I remember I wanted to tell you in the kitchen and like I got, then I got scared. And then like one time I wanted to tell you. But like, the eating disorder like doesn't let you because it's an it's it's an addiction so it's like no if you tell them like you have to let go of this and like you don't want to let go of this you have control like you want you need to keep going so it would like stop me from saying something even though, like i knew it was the, it was going badly like i didn't want to like let go of it at the same time um and then it just got to the point where like it went for a while until my parents caught on a little bit um and then yeah so i guess I don't want to say bullying, but the the wrong, the wrong things were said to you, and the, yeah. the wrong idea was was painted to you. It was already like in my head a little bit, like it was like confirming what I already thought about myself. Mm-hmm. But I was just talking to someone today, and they said like that someone said to their to their daughter, um, like oh, like like you're like they told her she was heavier than like someone else, and like in middle school, and like that, like already is like that's gonna affect her and like she and like it's like people can say these things and they're not even true this girl's not heavy um but when you say these things it really can like make someone think it is true and then it sets off right. sometimes a spiral right so as parents you know um first of all i'm just curious over how long of a period of time was this taking place so i felt this way throughout middle school mm-hmm. and then the breaking point was right before eighth grade mm-hmm. and then eighth grade was like the really the bad point and it's never gone away since right. then, but it's like maintaining. So, at, w- at what point um, did your you know parents catch on, and, and then you just I guess start going towards recovery? You guys can say that, okay? And you, and now you want me to go? First? Yeah, go ahead. First of all, I'm not Mrs. Herman. I'm Hani. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, Mrs. Herman's my mom. And thank you for having us. We're really appreciative that you decided to hear our story and share it. Of course. Um, thank you for your bravery, all, all three of you. For the, the courage to to come here and to to own the story and to share your experience and really the strength and hope for everyone that might be battling this and I would speculate that the vast majority of 
of people that do go through this are doing it certainly for some period of time without support yeah. and doing it in you know in the dark and behind closed doors without knowing what the solution is and where to go with it. So the fact that you are being brave enough to, to come here and to share your story and to shed the light of the recovery that you availed yourself of, like Ashrecha, really amazing what you're, what you're doing. Thank, Thank you. you. We, uh, we're taking a Tara's lead. Um, this is really her story. We're like, what do we call it? Like the best supporting actors, you know, <laughs> like on the side, her cheerleader. But we're really, this is really a Tara's idea to do this and we support it and we certainly have a parent perspective um that you know hopefully like you said hopefully we'll be able to resonate with others even if they're not dealing with the specific issue but also if they are to right. know that you're not alone in fact one of the things that my husband and i were talking about as we were driving here was like if seven years ago we heard somebody an mm. average Teaneck family or a Five Towns family that was just similar to us, if we had heard them talking about it, it would have, it doesn't, it doesn't make the situation easier, but it does give a little chizuk to know that, oh, it's not, it's not just us that's suffering. Yeah. And if I could just a add to that, uh, to what you said, I appreciate, you know, you having us on here so that we can share a tower of story. And one thing that I think really kind of, at least for me, and I don't know if it's maybe for both of you as well, that really got us through those really dark times uh, seven, eight years ago was thinking that one day we'd be sitting in a place like this and being able to help others. Yeah. It's really remarkable. That's, you know, the purpose of of having this conversation. I, I remember, you know, speaking to you guys and of course we'll, we'll get into it and we'll, and we'll We'll have this conversation, but just for, just, can I interject yeah. just for yeah. a moment? Sorry, sure. Nafi, I noticed that you began emoting there for a moment. What's coming up for you as you share yeah. that? Well, it's been a uh, been a very emotional journey these seven, eight years. Um, you know, some very difficult times there. We'll talk more about it, of course. And and like I said, you know, thinking about how we could help others really helped us get through this, and um, you know, in many ways, strengthened our connection to each other and as well as to uh, our Muna as well. Yeah. I do want to answer sure. your question about like what was going on for her and how we yeah. sort of like yeah. what how it kind of came to us. Um, so Atara was definitely struggling, but Atara's our oldest. So new parents, what do you, what do new parents really know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, it's funny because you're the oldest in your family and I'm the youngest in my family. Right. So, right, like, um, but, you know, you know it's like normal teenage stuff. Correct. Right, exactly. Yeah. Atara, like, I have a middle school daughter who seems to be struggling just like the average, uh, teen, you know, preteen, teenage daughter, you know, like self-esteem and like the typical stuff. Um, I, we definitely noticed um, maybe, I wouldn't even call it anxiety at the time. I would say more like, you just seem more down, you know, definitely seem more down but and moody, but it didn't. I didn't connect it to to food and eating. Um, so there were probably a number of things that led up to someone like really giving us a wake up call. Um, but I, I do specifically remember that we had a family gathering at at the pizza store in oh, Teaneck. That's what it was. You never told, you never told me why. Oh, great! You're hearing this for the first time. <laughs> I remember, I guess. But... it's all coming out now. Yes, yeah, all coming out. <laughs> <laughs> we're airing everything. No one you figured it out. Uh, we had a family um, get together with grandparents at the local pizza yeah. store with cousins. Yeah, I remember. And um, everybody's eating pizza. And after that gathering, my sister-in-law, who I'm very close with, um, also lives in Teaneck, um, called me up and said, I need to speak to you. And I was like, what's wrong? And she's like, something's wrong. Something's really wrong. Like you have, I think Atara needs help. I said, like, nobody wants to get that call. Yeah. Like, you know what I was get like, what do you mean something's wrong? Um, and she said, I, I watched Atara at the pizza store and I could, I could actually see her like agonizing over eating, I don't know if it was the first slice or the second slice. No, I didn't whatever. eat it at all. Oh, you didn't eat mm. it at all. No. And she noticed it, you know, and sometimes it does take an outsider or an insider, like a family she actually, member. She, she came up, she said to me, I remember this, she was like, oh, why aren't you eating pizza? And I was like, oh, I'm not, I don't like it, I'm not in the mood. Like, she was like, so what are you going to have for dinner? And I was like, and like, I genuinely meant this. I was like, yeah, I'm gonna have like a sweet potato for dinner. Like, that's what I, and she was like, that's not a dinner. I'm like, why is it not dinner? It's so healthy. Like, what do you mean? Like, I can tell you all about why sweet potatoes are so healthy. I was like stuck in that, like eating healthy, only vegetables, whatever. So she was like, no, it's not. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and she obviously, she saw something. Like she clearly, yeah. 
she saw you agonizing so and you, it was you didn't know to that your that that call was made no i did not it's probably it, it's it's first of all prophecy you for being able to receive that call and then i, I imagine sort of acting on it many people and it could, it could be you yourself were taken back insulted like it was a sister-in-law right why my sister-in-law calling me and telling me that it's something's hard. wrong with my kid right it's so hard so i guess you know, you heard that from her, and what was what did you do, what did you do from there? So from there, we again we didn't know what this was. Yeah. Um, this was not named, and so we went to a nutritionist. Somebody referred us to a nutritionist. Yeah. Um, and you, we went together. Right? Yeah. Daddy wasn't there. No. Right. Okay. So we went to the nutritionist. Nutritionist spent some time with us together and alone with you, and then came back and said. I don't think this is a nutrition issue. I think this is an eating disorder, and I'd like to refer you to um, a specialist. She said that to to you or both of you? Did she say it to you? She definitely said it to me. She didn't say it to me. Okay. Yeah. She said it to me privately. Um, and so we then looked for referrals, and which led us to a really amazing therapist. Are we allowed to give her a shout out on the air? Yeah, I <laughs> think know. so. I think her phone sure. might be ringing off the hook after this. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, Dr. Rebecca Hartstark um, has a private practice, and her um, one of her focuses is eating disorders. And she was I one of the people who saved our lives. When we, so. went, yeah. when we went to the nutritionist, I was like confused why you were bringing me there because I was like, this is not a nutrition issue. <laughs> but mm. I knew it wasn't. I was like, okay, like maybe the like, love. And like, I remember after we left, like, you thought it was a nutrition because like they, you didn't know it was an eating disorder mm -hmm. like i was still able to eat like my healthy foods like you weren't making me like have like right anything i was like oh okay great like i'm glad we went to the nutritionist not like a, th a therapist and then if i remember when we sat with the nutritionist she like i felt really called out because she said to me she's like she was like oh like how have you been feeling like physically and she's like she's like everything's blurry to you right now right and i was like how does she know because <laughs> like when you're when you're like starving yourself like your vision's blurry so like for all those months, like I couldn't really see so well. Like I couldn't see the board in school, so I, I don't know how I passed. I don't know, maybe they like they felt bad for me, and that's why they let me. Cause I, I couldn't see the mm. board. I really couldn't see the board. Yeah. Um, I couldn't take tests. Like I couldn't see it. Um, so when she said that, I was like, how does she, how does she know that? Like I can't see, but I think she knows like, nutri malnutrition. Like it, it does that. But I remember feeling really called wow. out. I, I want to zero in on a similar dynamic, but I would speculate that you experienced it very differently. Yeah. So so you just shared what your life looked like literally d while still in the problem yeah the blurred vision the starvation and i want to invite you to to unpack the nature of that condition for anyone that might be able to identify with it i also want to invite your parents to share something that to unpack what what you shared as that initial encounter with an objective party who cares about you compassionately and is you know, trying to open your eyes to something that you might not be seeing, but that like grappling with yeah. where do we go from here and just to be open to reach out to that therapist. And with the hindsight of, with the luxury of hindsight, you're saying how this particular therapist saved your life and this, and this situation. But I imagine it, it took a minute to, to grapple and get there. So well, starting with you, I, I also, I had a, a friend who like was like, you have issues like you need to get help like she like in eighth grade she was like trying like all my other friends were like oh you're so skinny like uh, they weren't there they weren't like they were just like complimenting me on it but one friend was like i'm gonna tell your parents like i was like you can't do that and like she would like threaten me and i, like, I cut her out i was like i can't talk to you anymore because like i didn't want her to re reveal like my my secret um but so that was i did have one person who was who was threatening to say something um but what did it look like um you're hungry all the time, um, but you're also like working out all the time. At least for me, it's like you don't care. Like and like the hunger, like it's trying to kind of feels good. And you're like okay, like it's like it's like a high. You get on it almost. Um, the difference between an eating disorder as an addiction and like other addictions is that as an addiction, like you're you're using something. You're using drugs or alcohol or gambling. This is like you're abstaining from something, but it's still the same effect. It's like the more you do it, the more you have to do it, and you cannot imagine not doing it. Um, and the doing it is the deprivation. Yeah, the deprivation. Right. So instead of indulging in something, it's the opposite. Dar, can you also share about because we really encountered this the idea of like your brain being hijacked by yeah. eating disorder? Yeah. So as it 
progressive people often think it's like their fault when they have an eating disorder like i'm no i'm it's my i chose to do it you didn't choose to do it at some point your brain really is hijacked and it's a mental illness and it's really forcing you to do it um so like one example i guess was like i really thought i was big like even when i was really not i like didn't understand why everyone was so concerned i was like why are you concerned like i'm not I'm not like those other anorexic people who are so skinny. Like, I don't, I don't look like them, even though I probably did. Like, I really thought I didn't look like that. Um, I want to highlight something that you mentioned. that We've had guests on the show that are doing really prolific work in the world of addiction and recovery. And they've shared with us what they refer to as the disease model, where in order for someone who's struggling with an addiction... To, to embrace the disease model, to recognize that, like you said, this is not a choice that is being made. This is a disease that is had. It's a, it's a mental um, disorder as well. And it has, of course, physical symptoms, but at its core, it's, it's a, it's, yeah. there's a disease there, which is, which is very liberating in one's Yeah, but that took me a to long time it. to recognize that because I didn't even think I had it. I didn't think I was like, like when I got diagnosed, I was like, but I'm not like I was just so confused why she was diagnosed diagnosing me as that because I was just like I genuinely thought like I looked normal and that I was like just eating healthy and being healthy and working out and I didn't understand why there was an issue so it took a while to like actually understand that there was and I an imagine issue. what makes it even more complicated and and challenging is that you you reference some other addictions like alcohol and drugs where it's very clear if that exists so it's it's complete abstinence that's the that's the response mm -hmm. to it but eating it's a critical aspect of a healthy life and now it's a matter of striking the balance and then dieting is celebrated as well and glorified so it's like this it, it's a very complicated behavioral type of addiction yeah, yeah. and that's yeah. why recovery is so hard right i'm sure we'll get to some of the, the treatment but yeah the hijacked anorexic star of brain actually can't like you're saying understand what you're doing and the choices that you're you're making so until you get back to a certain weight there's there's no talking to that side side of you tower right? Sorry, was, was there a point you know you're mentioning that the brain gets hijacked and it's uh, you know i think that when something is hijacked we know that it's hijacked you, you mean you knew that at some point i'm not in control of this yeah but in a way i also thought that i was in control like the only thing i felt like i could control was I was I thought I was I was really good at losing weight and that was like I didn't feel like I had friends I didn't even though I did like I didn't feel like I did mm -hmm. um I didn't feel pretty I didn't feel like good about myself so this is the one thing that I'm good at and I can do and I knew I was good at it because it was I was I was very good at it um I want to comment on the hijacking of the brain because that was something that we really learned through this process like yeah. we would go to the therapist so she would meet with a tower but she would also meet with us mm -hmm. and we would say things to her like Oh, but Atara said she's doing really well at this, or Atara said that, and she would say it back to us, that's not your Atara speaking. That is the eating disorder. And you, it's going to take time till you start to see the real Atara again. Um, and that was hard. That was really hard because as parents, we're not, I mean, we're both in the helping field, but this is not, <laughs> this is not our area. And we wanted to believe Atara. We wanted, we just want her to get well. So we were just like, just really wanted that so badly that we would believe anything. Um, but it took time and um, we could talk about like what that kind of, what the recovery process and what kind of methods that were used, which is a whole other yeah. aspect. But it took time for that recovery of the hijacking of the brain to happen. Yeah, and like besides the brain, it's like also just like all the symptoms of it, like dizziness and like over overworking out. So you're always sore. Um, you had mentioned that there was a time um before the diagnosis there was a time that you had considered going over to your parents in the kitchen and telling them what was going on yeah so can you take me through that moment you know what's going through your mind um yeah um well there's two separate times one with my dad one with my mom um one time it was like earlier on in it no they both were earlier on like in like not before it got like too crazy where i would not have even thought about doing that um but like I was like maybe I should say like I'm struggling with like my feeling bad about my weight and like I'm not eating as much I'm like I was almost said it to my dad and then I was like and the eating disorder was like no you can't you can't tell them because if you tell them then you have to stop this and you have to gain weight and you don't want to gain weight so I was like oh yeah that, you're right I don't want to do that so then I like just talked about something else I don't remember what happened and the other time was where it was a different situation where I was like 
ran things to my mom about something like something like i was like crying about like middle school stuff whatever and i was like maybe i'm gonna insert that i'm having issues with this also and i was like no we can't we can't do that so then we just like left that part out of the of the rant but it must have been must have been hard for you like you know because part of you wanted to tell them because i knew it was an issue like i knew like what i was doing wasn't good but also like it was the only thing going for me. I felt like, like I really was like unhappy, and I really felt like everything else was going badly. I, felt like I didn't like, I didn't like who I was friends with. I didn't like anything happening. So I was just like, this is the one thing I have like control over that I'm good at, and like I, I'm gonna be skinny. And I'm gonna, and I, I got, I was getting complimented for by, by tons of people, by relatives, by friends. Like it was looked at as a good thing. Like everyone's like, oh my gosh, you're so skinny. It's like, why would I want to stop? Like that's the one yeah. thing I'm good at. and I'm getting complimented for. So we're we're gonna we're gonna spend a nice amount of time. I imagine talking about how as society we can get better talking about these things or not talking about certain things yeah um but first uh, to hear from you know, khani and danielle um as parents your oldest child going through something extremely scary objectively scary you know um is it daniel or danielle by the way I usually go by daniel but it's nice daniel, i can nice. switch back and forth in different <laughs> worlds sensitive oh, you try you try to get it you try pronunciation of you try to catch me on a slip up i don't know i just want to be yeah. sensitive is it yeah. mama or momo and the tower went ahead and decided to get married to somebody named <laughs> daniel yeah oh, okay so I can that switch to daniel, daniel, maybe. <laughs> what's with that by the way a guy it's can't a guy can't daniel. marry a girl with the same name <laughs> as his mother but a a girl can marry a guy with the same name as his father. It's spelled differently. It's with an O and D. Yes. Oh, it's a totally See, different. Name. It's totally different. Totally it has an, different. She has Daniel Lasky has an O in his name, so it's different. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Gonna look into this one. Um, I get apology emails. By the way, I spell my my English name Mark M A R C, and then sometimes people will email me Mark with a K. Erroneous. <laughs> and then my they'll brother, realize my brother pays, also mm -hmm. spells it with a C. Okay, it's your nice. it's very European with a C. It's like no yeah and mm -hmm. awesome oh yeah. <laughs> see for awesome <laughs> um but i'll get like apology emails oh i'm so sorry like i didn't realize it's like it's okay yeah <laughs> you're okay it's okay not like you're just trying to like put me on blast for mispronouncing his name it's okay <laughs> mom <laughs> um but no, daniel and daniel is not okay erroneous but mark c and k that is okay yeah. i'm glad we spent three minutes talking about the name. <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> um but but as parents dealing with something like this you know, I know I, I'm I, I'm a parent of a three year old, and me and my wife, we have like our little huddle sessions. Like, how are we getting her into bed? Like, how are we doing this? You know, like, I imagine you two are talking to each other. You're, well, take us through, I guess, the early stages of that conversation. What does that look like for you? Yeah, well, I'll start a little started. bit. I mean, the, the the as we've been talking, you know, the, this whole wake up call process definitely took some time. I mean, I think it's hard for any parent to come to grips with that a child might be struggling with something, especially something as serious as as an eating disorder and to, to not be aware of that or even be in denial, I think goes along with it. I'm a psychologist, right? So yeah. if anything, I, I should be with some, an area I work with specifically, but I think it's just so easy to, you know, just try not to- It's like not my child. Like Yeah, it couldn't yeah. happen to, to my child, right? And then, you know, we started to, I guess, come to grips with it slowly that this is what we were faced with and, and how are we gonna go forward? Well, I can say when they brought me to the, to the therapist and like they met, separately we met together and i think i met like me but just with her and she, when she said to me she was like okay like you know we talked to like your parents and everything we talked to you like you have anorexia nervosa like she said like the she like diagnosed me she like wrote down like you know like this is what you have and i was like i remember hearing those words and i'm like what I'm like no i don't like <laughs> like i was so shocked that she was telling me that because i was like I imagined all those really skinny people who are like really sick, who are about to die. And like, and I was like, that's not me. Like, I'm just like a small person. I'm not, I'm like, whatever. I was like, it's not, I was, I was shocked. Um, so when I think back to really when this was really like the diagnosis and that really, really dark time, I, um, I actually have a physical reaction. Like I, I physically like feel very emotional. Um, it was, and it that's was, okay. It, it was crushing. Yeah. It was it was really really crushing. Um, I felt like what like we're just like aren't we like Hashem like aren't we good people like aren't we our jobs are to help people you know my husband's a therapist I work with people with special needs you know we're we have friends we're we're kind like I felt like we're we're okay. we're not the best parents but like. Mm -hmm pretty good you know we're doing okay um 
And it was just crushing. It was just like, how could, like, I just, I know as a mom, I'm sure a lot of moms who go through this, I felt like, did I do something wrong? I felt guilt. Did I say something wrong? Did I do something wrong? Um, was I a bad role model? Like a lot of like guilt. Um, and it took a long time to realize that, you know, we didn't do something wrong. Um, and we did plenty of things wrong. We did plenty parents. of things wrong. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Our kids have wrong. a list. Don't worry. Yeah, true, they keep but... a list. Remember when you didn't tell us to do that? Remember? Yeah. Well, remember when you um, came but... last on visiting day? Oh, yeah. that, that, <laughs> here we go. Okay. That's how much time do you have for the podcast? She's got, she's got a list. <laughs> That's the top of the list. I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah coming late to visiting day is big. No, not coming late. The last <laughs> one. Not late. Last. Not late last. The kid <laughs> waiting in the field. There was an explanation, but no we're, we're one else to... there. And all of a sudden, your parents they can show contact up. us offline if they want to know. <laughs> Danielle, what, what... you have to admit, yeah. it was a low moment for us. Uh, yes. Step yes. out. Okay. Good parents. Uh, CBS might call about yeah. that one. No, 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 no. <laughs> but you know, I, um, but I, it, it was it was soul crushing. But I remember, yeah. I remember when you sent me to the doctor before the nutritionist. She wanted to see like what my weight was. I didn't. I thought it was a normal appointment. I didn't realize like she had made the appointment to see what my weight was. I thought it was just like a checkup. Um, and I, but I, I knew it was coming for a few weeks. So I, I actually, I never told you this. I gained like four pounds before the appointment. You never heard that. And then, and like you were like, and then I was like, she's gonna think it's. So now I'm gonna, I'm at like a, a normal weight. Like she's not gonna like even be like. No one's gonna be concerned. Like and I went on the scale and I, whatever. And she was like, my mom was like, what? That's your weight? And I was like. What's the big deal? I, I, I'm like, I was less than this a few days ago. Like, what do right. you, like, what do you, never heard that. Like, I was like, I was not, this is heavy. Like, what are you, like, I remember like being like, huh? Like, I gained it. So, like, you wouldn't think that. Why are you still thinking that? Wow. I think it's, it's, it's cool what you, what you shared about accepting that it's not the result of something that you did or yeah. didn't do. Yeah. And, you know, we, we meet a lot of people. Yeah. And a lot of people, encounter an Asayan in Amuna that relates to a health crisis in their family. And if a person's child is diagnosed with a, you know, with a severe diagnosis, the the, the work that they need to do, of course, is all Amuna based. But that layer of not, you know, taking ownership and taking blame for that diagnosis is usually not part of the process. Here, when it comes to this, the, the nature of this disorder is such that it's so easy for us to conflate the matter and think, oh, what did I do? What did I not do? What could I have done better? And I think our role here is to, is to shed some light where this is, this is a disorder that exists in our community and it's not the result of any bad actions. Right. Yeah, I mean, partially it is. Like... <laughs> To some extent, like there sure. are people who are responsible. I mean, it wasn't my parents, but like, like eating disorders are biopsychosocial disorders, right? So like, they're biological, meaning like you could be more prone to it. So like, somebody else could have been like me and like spent the summer like not eating and then like bounced back and like not have had an issue. Like I know people who who did that and like they're like, I'm just gonna star myself, whatever. And then they didn't have it. They didn't lead to anything. Um, they're psychological things in your brain and then they're also social which means like things around you can inf influence it happening so like you could have like the the genes for it that might make you more susceptible but if like you have a really good social environment everything's going well and no one says anything like that to you like it won't get like triggered for me it did get triggered because of what people were saying and it, and i guess also like not anything you guys you guys never spoke like this but like people in the family and like would say like diet things and that does, and, like, and from a young age it trickles in and yeah it gets yeah. to you and you so, so let me ask you out of curiosity we have a psychologist here as well <laughs> um it, it does it work the opposite um as well meaning it the, the constant talk of dieting and skinny and weight can have a negative effect is is also either abstaining but speaking you know just positively about eating healthy food and wholesome and eating more does that make it less uh possible for someone to develop 100 percent. like if people like instead of like at like a shop of people being like oh i'll have like a, a small piece of cake like and then like, your six-year-old child hears this and it's like oh cake's bad like it makes that association instead of being like oh i i love this cake like i want to have more of it like and, and if they hear you saying that like they're like oh it's not bad to eat cake like that does have an impact like in a positive way that it's okay to eat things that are unhealthy and not like and to not diet and that kids pick up on it 
In fact, that was part of like the recovery. You had to eat certain things that like you had avoided. Foods, right? Right. Well, that yeah. was that was its different thing because I didn't understand like when we started recovery. I thought like, okay, you want me to gain weight, you want me to be healthy. Okay, healthy means eating salads, eating healthy food, like like that. You want me to be healthy? I'll be healthy. Like I, I'm happy to be healthy. So like when they started, I remember like we went somewhere for Shabbos, and then my dad was like, okay, like have like a cookie for dessert. I'm like, I ate a meal. Like what? I don't need a cookie. Like that's not healthy. It's like you need to have a cookie. I was like, I don't understand why that is necessary. But the whole point was I had to eat all these unhealthy foods to like not to like for still gain weight, but also like to not be scared of them. Like living a healthy life people sometimes would like it's very dangerous on like social media like i would like see these like people who posted like recovery stories and like they'd be like yeah i recovered and now like i'm like this and like they would be like only eating healthy food and i thought that that was like what recovery could be like you just eat really healthy and like like a fit like a nutrition person a fitness blogger yeah and that's not what recovery actually is recovery is being able to eat all kinds of foods and balance them in your life and i was so when they started making me eat unhealthy foods, I was just like really confused why that was necessary. And I guess that was a key part of the recovery. And, yeah. And what was that? I guess you know. Yeah, I think it might be helpful to to lay some foundation of yeah. the recovery yeah. journey, like the where that a, started and yeah. that process, and then I think we can build on that. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about the model of? Oh sure. I mean, like you, you you mentioned <laughs> that the heart stuck before and how much she was a big part of uh, really helping us in the target to this. Uh, place right here and the model that she, she uses and is really i think the uh for a childhood it was considered a childhood eating disorder because of her age mm -hmm. so, right and the idea of what's called family-based therapy where all of us would come in for sessions our entire family of six okay that didn't, that didn't last long <laughs> Three we, can talk, we can talk about that you, you can just imagine you know her, her two little brothers <laughs> on the stories. couch like what are we doing here <laughs> we have some good stories her sister who just wants to go to bat mitzvahs like you know and now is missing the giveaways or something <laughs> yeah, no, right. she's still angry about it. um but but the idea of like i mentioned before that the the brain that's starved isn't able to have this kind of rational discussion and realize that it, it it's killing itself and therefore the, the primary need is to recover the, the the weight and get back to that certain weight point and and since you don't have a willing participant because you can't the brain is completely hijacked uh, the idea is that the child will be you know under the, the direction of the family um be guided towards getting this you know all of that weight gain back which is a very very challenging process. Essentially means, meant that my husband and I sat for hours and hours on end for every single meal with a Tara, which is very hard to imagine. If you, Feeding a 14-year-old. Right, Especially when you when have, have little kids. Five other kids, right? Right. Yeah. We have three other children. Three other and children. Tara is the oldest. Um, but, you know, you are talking about like little kid, you know, you have a little, you have a young child and it's like yeah. huddling with your wife, like how are we going to get them to bed, right? It's like all these things when they're little that you can control and dictate. And then you're faced with something like this and you realize, A, you have very little control over certain things. Um, but the, the, the FBT, the family-based therapy, the feeding was... It, very, it's, 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 it was very painful. I mean, from my perspective, like... For them, it's like hard to like be dealing with that. But like for me, it's like it's like asking someone to like drink poison. And that's what it felt like every second I had to eat. Like I remember like in the beginning when like I have this like memory of like my dad, you had like a bowl of like Entenmann's donuts and like like, like the pop -um thingies. Mm -hmm. And like most people I think would like love to be forced to like eat Entenmann's donuts. <laughs> but like you like brought them down and you were like, okay, like. Here's your like, you know, like nighttime snack, whatever. And I was like, I was like, and I remember like I was screaming and like running away. Like it felt like poison. Like I was like, I cannot put that in my body. Like I felt like I, like I couldn't. Like I was like, how are you making me eat that? Like that, that's how like severe it felt. Um, and it was also something that was hard because like sometimes they would like give me a food that I actually like didn't like, like, like right. a, a cake I didn't like or like a food like or a sandwich I didn't like. Like I could just say if, if I have to, I said that a lot of things I didn't like that I actually did like because I just didn't want to eat it. So they had to still give me the foods even if I said I didn't like it. So that was like also like you're forcing yourself to eat food that like actually like the, you, is nauseating you and you don't like it and you have to eat it anyways. So that that was really challenging. We don't know if it's the part of your brain that just doesn't like the food. Right. Or, or yeah, we didn't know. That's That's don't eat any food. We had no idea. So, so I mean, you know, for you, Atara, w during the recovery, is there a point of 
if you seeing this all like happen where your your parents are having to feed you, you're 14 and they're feeding you and they're making you eat this, making you eat that. Is there a point for you of like, gosh, how did I get here? It was, I thought it was worse than like the eating disorder, like when it was happening, like the eating was like definitely harder. Cause like at least like with like the eating disorder, like I was unhappy, but I was like controlling that aspect here. I'm unhappy and I now have control over this aspect and it's actually physically nauseating and it's horrible and I don't, and I'm not enjoying this at all. Um, and it's like, that's why it's like different. Like when you're, str- when you're recovering from like drug addiction, and alcohol, you're abstaining from something. This is like all day, every day for the rest of your life. You have to force yourself to have healthy something. integration. Yeah. Like you can't avoid food. You have to have food, but that takes every second of your day to like be conscious of that and like do it. Um, and it could take all day. We would sometimes yep. sit 12 to 16 hours a day. Yep. Like if you don't, you know, like you could start breakfast at nine and it might go to 12 and then you and start lunch, lunch mm, yeah. and yeah. we would sit there. So it was, and, and you're a teenager. So yeah. friends, school, what, what was that all like? So <laughs> this was not fun. Um, so I was, when the, I started recovery, like around peace out time. So, so I was still in eighth grade um, and I still had to go to school. Um, so breakfast at home, then go to school. My mom would come for lunch in the parking lot and I would eat lunch in the car. Oh my and, God, I forgot about that. And then like they brought, they had, they gave me snacks to have at the nurse. The nurse like didn't know what they were doing. So like she would like put me in like a room with no one else and like say, okay, eat your snack in the room. I was like, obviously I'm not gonna eat the snack if no one's watching me. So every day I would like throw it out and like I would count like how long it would take to eat each one. So like no one would like, suspect anything. And then I would do some workout in that room and then I would come out and like, yeah. I would come home every day. My mom would be like, oh, it's so like, what snack did you have from like the snack, the snacks that you have at the nurse? I'm like, oh, I had this one. I'm like, no, I didn't. Um, and this is during recovery. Yeah. It's and actually interesting because you were asking about like how long it took to recognize like there's really a problem. So even after the diagnosis, so it's harvested, right? This is like around Pesach time. So there's still a little bit time left of eighth grade. Yeah. Not that much time because, you know, in eighth grade, they finish early and i think we were just kind of like okay like yeah she could still go to school and Mm -hmm. we could still have our full-time jobs and the nurse will give her the snack like we it still took a little longer for us to realize that we needed to actively be involved and you can't really give it to someone else to do we tried (laughs) and it was also really hard going to school because like i was miserable dealing with this like i didn't want to like recovery was horrible like and i had to be like go to school and be a person like that was just not working um, but then it, and then it was worse because then my mom works in, worked in a camp in Camp Missoura. Um, now my dad does, but we, she, I was like, can I just stay home this summer? And like, she's like, I'm not making like daddy do this the whole summer. Like you're coming to camp. So I had to go to a new camp te- as a teen in the teen division. Um, and every morning I would come to her cabin. I wouldn't go home my, my bunk to like davening and breakfast. Um, and I'd sometimes be there till lunch and sometimes I wouldn't join my bunk till 2 p.m. And everyone would be like, oh, where were you? And I was like, oh, I had things to do. Like, it was like socially off. Like, people were like, why is she only with us half the day? Like, it's teens. Um, and that was really hard. But like, so I would sometimes like, I would want to be, I would sometimes like push myself to eat because I wanted to like go join things. So it was helpful sometimes. That's the social um, aspect like you had mentioned. Yeah. yeah. It's actually interesting because we actually talk a lot about that summer. Mm-hmm. Not you and I, it's our, but daddy and uh, I. Yeah. So, you know, like the slogan, like best summer ever. It's like summer 2016 worst summer ever was <laughs> like that's like like literally yeah, the worst summer, summer ever, ever. Yeah. um it's interesting uh, though you touched on something in tower because um we've often talked about that that summer in some ways was the lowest and the worst and in some ways going i feel parts of that summer actually helped you and was part of saving you because even though it was very hard to come in as a teen to a new camp that you hadn't been a part of before on the other hand you made so many friends and socially you connected with so many people that we thought it was actually a really good boost to your self-esteem. But even though it was a nightmare for us because we were trying to work and give you food and like try to keep you happy. And I'm sure it was extremely difficult for you, as you said, like you're missing davening, you're missing activities and people are like, well, where are you? I remember at one point somebody said, Oh, Tara must be having such a hard summer. She right, she really needs you. Like she's having a hard time socially. Like, like she just like not homesick because we're there, but like she just likes to be with you a lot. And I remember like 
I just wanted to like punch that person because I'm like, <clears throat> no, actually, she really doesn't want to be with me. You don't know what's going on, you know, behind that's, the door. You really don't know. It's, it's incredible how little we know of what goes on in people's lives. Yeah. And yet mm -hmm. how quick we are to tell ourselves a story based on the little surface level facts that we have. And others. And tell others a story. Correct. Correct. And in reality, all it takes is a moment of introspection to just examine one's own life and know how much is going on in your own life that so few people know about. And just project that for a moment. Maybe this other person that I'm encountering also has something going on that I have no clue and can't fathom what yeah. they're addressing right now. It was helpful. Like when the friends I became like close with in my bunk, like I ended up like I would tell them like this is what's happening. This is why I'm gone half the day. This is like whatever. And like once I had like a bunch of people in my bunk knowing, like, it felt better because I was like, hey, like they don't think I'm just like a freak that just leaves half the day. <laughs> and what the hell, like, her mom? All day. Yeah, like I'm not like <laughs> I, I. It looked I, like it looked weird. Like why is she only joining us at two p.m. every day and like never had the meals? Um, but. Yeah. And sidewalk to, sale. This honking is brought to you by the <laughs> sidewalk sale. Sidewalk sale. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we have road rage. Thanks for inviting <laughs> us on the. This guy is. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate you inviting us on the day of the sidewalk you, sale. You, sir, have just interrupted an episode of the Meaningful People podcast. Get back in your Riots car. Riots commence. How are you? Oh, drama. Sheesh. Put the baseball bat down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. But thank to, you, to your point about, you know, this definitely sensitized us to the, you know, internal world that, that every individual, every family is kind of going through. And I hope that is one of the messages that people take as they listen to this, just having that, you know, in increased sensitivity, just realizing that everyone is, you know, whether you realize it or not, is, is definitely struggling with something. Hey, 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 we'll be right back to this episode of the Meaningful People podcast. I got some breaking news for you. I spoke today to Justin from Collars & Co. I'm like, hey, Justin, you know what? Uh, holiday season's coming up and there's a certain group of people who I really want to do something special for. He's like, sure, who? I said, first responders, Hatzala members. He's like, okay, what do you want to do? I said, let's give them 20% off. And that's exactly what we're doing. 20% off for all Hatzala members, first responders, and their families. Head to collarsandco.com. The shirt I'm wearing right now, this beautiful, comfortable, strong, amazing looking shirt. You can only get at collarsandco.com. If you are an Atsala member or a first responder, use promo code MMHEROES. You'll get 20% off any order over $150. That is MMHEROES. And if you're not a Hatsala member, maybe become one. But anyways, you can use promo code MEANINGFUL for 15% off. Use promo code MEANINGFUL for 15% off at collarsandco.com. I want to ask you guys um, as, a, as a family, um, I believe this is the first time you're speaking about this publicly, yes. especially on a platform like this. Um, it's something that either intentionally or unintentionally you've kept sort of private to yourselves, maybe not even in your family knows the details. Uh, so, so why now? Why, why is, why now do you want to speak out about this? Um, well, partially <laughs> not that this is a good thing, but like we always said that like, it could get in Shadokhan, wave Shadokhan, which is sad, but. Yeah, look, I, it comes from that parental instinct that, yeah. um, I mean, you're, you're right, that we're, we are sharing for the first time. And I think a lot of people listening to this will be very surprised other than some of our family and, and a few close friends and some of our I don't think almost anybody really, really knows the story. And it comes from that instinct to, yeah, to wanting to really protect the Tara. And, and um, I think you're right, that was one of the considerations. But again, we're we're hoping to, you know, really try to, Try to change this. You know, I often think about what Rabbi Goldberg down in Boca Raton, uh, ah, who's yeah, a huge proponent, yeah, of, of of mental health awareness, and has a podcast about that as well. And you know, he he, he talks about. He gets he's also very involved in Shidduchim, and he gets a lot of phone calls from people, and they'll ask him, "Well, you know, does anyone in the family get therapy or take medication?" Like that. Right, yeah. that's what people ask. Um, and they want to know if you're in therapy. What did he say? Therapy or do they take any medication? Take medication. And he's kind yeah, of. And, and he and said, if I'm getting this correct, yeah. he says something like, "Well." Or what he's thinking is like one second. So, who would you who would you want to date here? Because everyone's got something, right? You know, Wayne Bice says, Shane Shum, they says there's always something. So, do you want the family that went ahead and took it seriously, got the best therapist, maybe there was medication, you know, whatever it was, or do you want them the one that swept it under the, the rug here? <laughs> so, so it's a good thing yeah. if if they're taking these yeah. steps here. I'm very uh, me and my husband are Shachlanim. Um, 
They're and amazing. They've already been successful. Oh, wow. They're fantastic. That's, that's, wedding. Yeah. that's amazing. But, that's part of why you're a meaningful person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're, but, we're give your email out. You're going to be very busy. <laughs> I get a lot of calls. <laughs> <laughs> um, but someone called me and they were like, oh, like this girl came okay, she's asking me questions. And she said like, oh, and just one more question. I know I know it sounds bad, but like, like does any, did she ever have like, like uh, depression, anxiety, like anorexia? She even said that. And I was like, whoa. And like, take many medications. And I'm thinking like, I honestly like don't think she did. But I'm like, and I said to her, I was like, no, but like, why would that be an issue? Like that shouldn't right. prevent a shit off. And I was about to go off on her and be like, you, know, you, know, you think I shouldn't have gotten married? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But like, just to answer your question, I think that the answer really is that we took you early to Tara and you felt like this was something you wanted to, to share because you thought it could it could help others. Yeah, and so we wanted Atara, to support that. Come, what, what, like what's... Uh... I always wanted to, but then I always was like scared what people would think. Not that I think it's embarrassing because it's not. Um, but like, just like it was always the wrong moment. Like in high school, I've been like weird and like seminary or whatever. Um, I think like also like it's now like a good time because like there's just like I'm very we're very thankful. Um, I got married eight months ago. Yeah. So nice. Um, I'm due. I'm expecting and like there's a lot of like bracha. Yeah. So it's a lot of like bracha that like came my way and also like I remember like like I dove in like one of my one of my like um incentives for recovery was that I want to have I never told you that I want to like have a child. Like I it's in my diary. I wrote it. Never heard that. Yeah. Um. Cause like it can stop me from having so yeah so wow. build, building a family is one of those things that yeah an eating disorder can take that away like fertility so yeah. that was a big thing i remember i dove in for it and i everyone is it's in my diary speaking of of can i open a parenthesis for a moment you, you can open one that. opening mm -hmm. a parenthesis you mentioned about shidduchim as a consideration to conceal information yeah. and i feel like we've been we've been talking a lot about enhancing and improving the the shidduch process we had uh Tzipora grodko on on the platform that was and, amazing right <laughs> that was incredible thank yeah. you she's incredible yeah. and i think all of the points that that she was highlighting one of which is i think relevant here where we've spent so much time as a society keeping certain walls up and concealing certain information um, in an attempt to preserve a certain image for the purposes of Shadokim. And then what happens is people get married, and then the reality of who they are reveals itself. Yeah. And how cool would it be if in the dating process, people can connect not only through right. their milas, but also through their struggles and through the things that yeah. Hashem wants them to work on. And like, let that be part of what people are connecting on through the Shidduchim process. Yeah, like Baruch Hashem, I didn't go through the Shidduchim process. Like I met my husband in high school. Yes. Um, but like, I cannot even imagine what it would have been like and like how like just would have been horrible. Like that would have been like my issue with like the people like, oh, but she, cause like also like it's maintaining, you're always dealing with this. Like I still have a therapist, like I don't see her often. But like, I still like, when I go through life changes, always like check in with her. Um, and like, it's always like, if I, I, I don't fast. So like, I don't even fast Yom Kippur. Um, Cause that, that just biologically sets it all off again. Um, and before that gets controversial for anyone, alcoholics don't drink alcohol on Purim either. Yeah. We're under their chuppah. Exactly. Ever. Yeah. Yeah. Ever. So it's never, um, but like, it's always maintaining. So like there's still foods that like are harder to eat. Like, I don't know, like donuts were always like one of my they're called fear foods. Oh gosh. Um <laughs> no, but I Listen, like brought donuts <laughs> to the office today. That's perfect. They're delicious. <laughs> but like we enjoy them. I challenge myself to like not avoid them, but like if someone's or if I'm at a Hanukkah party, like I'm gonna purposely I'm gonna purposely eat it so that I'm not giving in. Because right. even like passively avoiding a food, like can give into it. So like, I'm very aware if like, I see myself avoiding something, then I'm like, okay, now we're going to eat it. Cause I see that you're avoiding it. It takes a lot of self-awareness. At the risk of being strength. insensitive, have you developed a preference for which type of donut on <laughs> Hanukkah? Yeah, the jelly donut. Oh. Okay, but not, like, not one of those crazy spots Cause we've gone nuts yeah. with, Wait, the, with the, the donuts. Wait, but the jelly donuts in Israel? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my sister, on, my sister came back from my wedding. My wedding was at, like right before Hanukkah. So I asked her to bring me a jelly donut from 
Israel. So she <laughs> she brought she me did? one. It was fresh. Oh, really? There you go. Right, right. She went yeah. for her That's for a real miracle. Oh, that, that right there is healthy integration. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I I was actually, like, I'm going to fly in a donut from Israel. <laughs> exactly. That's how far I'll go. I think we well, one thing to, to your point, though, you asked about, you know, I mean, sorry, I didn't go through the shit of process, but, you know, as far as like connecting on that deep level, and if you want to say anything about like, you know, how our, our wonderful son Lord did, you know, kind of, you know, su- support you through the process. Of course, he knew everything. And, you know, it was, I think, a, a, was and is a part of your continued recovery. Yeah, he's very supportive. Yeah. That's very important, probably, you know, to the maintaining of everything that, yeah. you, that you go through. Also, in terms of like when you were asking, um, like, why now? And that's yeah. how I shared, you know, from her, you know, we've, my husband and I always said, like, we want to take her lead. Um, but one of the reasons that we felt we've been talking about this for a little while about sharing our story is because we've seen the brachos that have come our way. Um, and we've, we're so proud of Atara. I mean, she's just an amazing, amazing young woman on many levels, not just because um, her strength around this area, but just overall. And her siblings are amazing also. And um, we've just, you know, even just meeting, meeting her husband in high school. Yeah. Getting married. Um, just seeing the things that she's doing, we felt like Hashem has really blessed us. And there was just something pulling us that said we have to share our story to help others, to give chizuk. We are not professionals. Again, you know, this is not our area of expertise. We're just just a family who yeah. experienced this. I, and I think, you know, and this is the part of the, of the podcast where we get to, I think, one of the most important reasons why we're sitting here right now. And listen, you're going to search the statistics, how one in every how many girls are, are struggling with an eating disorder. It's and what's crazy is that I didn't know anyone like any like I had no one to talk to you about it in middle school and high school. Nothing. Right. Um, It's not good for people who are in the midst of an eating disorder to be talking to someone who has it because then they just help each other. Yeah. Give each other tips, which is not good. Which is why Google is very dangerous. Yeah, there's a oh, lot Google's of Google's terrible. There's a lot of communities <laughs> out there um, that are websites that help anorexics help each other and give each other tips, which was, is not good. Right. Um, but like it would have been helpful later on, like in high school, to like have other people going through it. Like I know I don't have any friends. Like I could have still I can talk to you about this. Like I have friends who like struggled a little bit, but like I still don't have anyone to talk to you about it. And like I'm fine. But like, it wouldn't have wouldn't have been so nice if I had someone I knew I could reach out to. It's like I'm gonna give you a number that people can reach out to me on. But like, I had no one to like. There was one person who wrote in the Jewish link, like an article, and like I emailed her once or twice. But it was like, who wants to email this like older like like I don't know like it yeah. wasn't the same. Yeah, we felt the same way. We we didn't have people that we 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 could talk to, and I hope we could be that. I mean, and I know we we have Connie kind of sometimes in, in talking to to families and really. One thing we, we've, I think, tried to do is is paint the picture that recovery is possible. And I think when, I don't know if you know this, but like, it's given a lot of chizuk to people when they see that got married, and life is moving forward. Yeah, that's you know, you know, we've, I've interviewed people on this podcast who, who unfortunately they had a daughter that wasn't able to cope with what they were going through through their eating disorder. It's part of the reason I feel it's so important to have you sitting here because I don't know the numbers, but I have a feeling that there's a lot of girls out there, a and lot and guys and guys, hundred yeah. percent. There's a lot of there's a lot of girls and guys out there, um, in in our circles, in our in our Jewish world, in the from world, yeah. that are struggling with this, whether yeah. borderline, whether more extreme, and I think it's super important to show you. To and show, we need a healthy version of showing it because a lot of times it's like. This is recovery. Recovery is not only eating healthy and it's not working out. Recovery is going to get ice cream and doing this and all these things and balancing it. And obviously like not eating ice cream every night, but like being normal. And like a lot of times it's not shown that way on like social media or other places. And people think mm. people get the wrong right? Yeah. People get the wrong impression. Or they think like it's just like you recover and it's just over. Um, they should know that it's always a process. I know you brought up fasting. Yeah. Um, oh, the one. <laughs> yeah, you, 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 don't, you don't fast. As, in terms of Yom Kippur, Tisha B'Av, is there a way Nothing. to make that day more yeah, so meaningful no, to you? No like, fasting. Yeah, so Tisha B'Av actually I still make very meaningful. Um, like, I'll be like crying watching a video while I'm like eating food. <laughs> it's, just, yeah. it's just different. 
Yo, um, gold has a way of doing that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. He watched this video. Um, but obviously, Yom Kippur, like you worked with Rabunim, who. Yom Kippur is hard because I just, like, the spiritual side of me just wants to be there all day. And, like, I love it. But, like, I have to, like, leave and come back and, like, leave and come back. And, like, it's Shiarim. So it's, like, really hard. Actually, I got a head there last year not to do Shiarim because it was just, it was really hard. Um, Shurim is like an ounce every yeah, like nine it, minutes. Which is like, right. which is like think about so it, it, counter. It, it, it makes sense halachically, but it yeah. plays into the whole restricting idea. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's right. Like, it doesn't work. It doesn't. So last year, I, didn't, I, I, I couldn't even do it. Um, but like, yeah, it's it's just a different Yom Kippur. But like, I think Shane Duplatsky, you sent me, she she posted on her Instagram, you sent me a screenshot. I sent you a screenshot of it. Um, she said like, she was asking people like, what does Tisha B'Av mean to you? And somebody wrote, a day I have to eat anyway. And she said, like, your eating is more holy than my fasting. Wow. Like, yeah. shout out to Shane D. Yeah. Because, yeah. like, <laughs> it's true. Like, it's yeah. hard. And it's also hard. And, like, I've had people say really insensitive things to me on fast days. Like, I can say one of them. Like, <laughs> I can say a bunch of them. One of them. <laughs> people, if you haven't been able to tell, we use humor as a coping mechanism. Yeah. <laughs> someone, some, someone was like, you're so lucky you don't have to fast. I'm like, I'm so lucky. I have a reason I'm not allowed to fast like that. Like, I'm so lucky of anorexia. That's you're like, I'm so lucky. <laughs> or like, it's so insensitive that you're eating and like in camp, eating in front of us when we're fasting. Where do you want me to go? Like, I have to eat. Like, turn around. Like, yeah. I, I have to. Like, I'm taking care of myself. Really. Like, uh, on, on the other side, I don't know if he's, I think he might have spoken to you once, but my friend Rabbi Yankov Glasser, um, I th- it might have been that first summer, or maybe summer afterwards, you were, you know, having a hard time with not not fasting. And I spoke with him and what he told me, maybe he shared it with you also, was that it's it's not that you're breaking your fast. It's, it's, that's not the, the, the case at all. It's this is your mitzvah. This is how you yeah. keep Tisha B'av. This is how you keep. So a lot of people Kippur. have said to me that that what I'm doing is a mitzvah. It's mm-hmm. pikuach nefesh. Taking care of yourself. Um, Remember during yeah. COVID? Um, during COVID, what was it? There was something during COVID where the Rabbanim said, I think about going to Minyanim or something, or 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 the Amudim health ho- help hotline was open mm-hmm. on on Shabbos. It's Kuch uh, Nefesh, you know, you have to call. Right, it's not breaking Shabbos, it's keeping Shabbos exactly. a different way. Exactly, yeah. exactly. I want to also yeah. highlight something that you mentioned sort of in passing. You said that, Recovery is not something that is done once and then it's done. Yeah. But it's sort of a, a, a life work. And I want to invite you to to elaborate on that that concept. Um, I mean, part of it is you don't a lot of people never fast again. Some people. I don't I can't ever see it happening in the near future. Um, because again, like the biological starving yourself reminds you of what starving yourself feels like and it goes into that whole cycle. It's so, like you don't want to remind yourself what starving feels like. Um and then also like Again, like making those decisions consciously all the time of like, I'm going to eat this, even though people are talking about it and saying it's really unhealthy um, or stuff like that. Being mindful of when I'm working out, what my intentions are, if I'm doing it to feel healthier or to move my body, if I'm doing it because I'm trying to lose weight. Um, so like for years, I couldn't work out. Um, I started being able to recently because now that I'm like pregnant, like it's like a different focus. Like I'm not thinking about, I don't want to lose weight because it's not safe. So like, that's been easier for me. Um, but yeah, no, definitely like just a lot of like, and also like combating like, what people say. Like, like sometimes when people will be like, oh my gosh, like, I don't know, like, that's so unhealthy. I'm like, no, it's not. Or I'll be like, okay, you can eat it sometimes. Like, I'll, I'll combat what people say a lot of the time. Um, like, relatives, friends, like, I'm very like, nah, I'll say something. But also, it's a lot of like tuning out what people say. Like, like, I worked in a different, I, I'm a teacher. Um, I worked in a school at one point and in the teacher's lounge, people would like say so many like things that like were not okay about like dieting and like bodies and whatever. And like, it, like I have to learn how to tune it out. Like people like, and it's like hard because people will say things that can really like, can like make me scared about food or like maybe scared about bodies or like whatever different things. And, like, I'm like, what if that happens to me? Or what about, what if I, I can't eat that now? Like I have to be like, no, like they're just being crazy. And like, it's okay to like eat that food sometimes. And, and, I'm not going to gain 500 pounds when I get pregnant. And like people would just say things and it yeah. would like scare me. Um, so learning how to like tune out other people all the time. Like I, if some people are talking about something like dieting, sometimes I'll like walk away. Like I walked away from like Shabbos meals before. Um, or I'll 
fight people at Shabbos meal and I'll be like, that's not true. You can't yeah. say that. <laughs> so um, I guess it let's, let's, depends who it is. <laughs> let's talk about that a little bit in terms of, you know, nowadays there is a big emphasis on dieting and people go to some links, i.e. Ozempic, and these things are becoming extremely prevalent and rampant and everyone's just trying to find the quickest way to lose the, the most yeah. amount of weight possible. It's a family that's that's dealing with this. I want to sort of uh, hear your take on on this topic it's interesting because i've i've seen we've seen people in our community who've done like rapid weight loss things um if they're not a friend of ours i, I mean i don't say anything but i've sort of adopted this thing over the last few years where if i want to give a compliment to my friend whether they've lost weight or whatever i'll like i'll comment on something very specific like oh i love your dress you look great yeah you know as opposed to like oh my gosh you lost so much weight you look amazing like, I mean, I don't want to offend them. Maybe they want that compliment, um, but that's not, that's something that I've But also because sometimes you don't, you don't know, like maybe that person did it in a healthy way, but maybe they didn't. And if right. you complimenting their rapid weight loss could be the way that people were doing to me, right. where they were complimenting me and it was not in a healthy way. It was encouraging. Or maybe they're that. sick and they lost, like we don't, exactly, yeah. we don't always know. It's like we were talking about, we don't always know what's going on behind closed doors. I'm, 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 yeah. Something I've adopted is just, I'm, I'm a little more careful about compliments and what the compliment is Ra friend. there's a there's a therapist who lives um in the community rachel tuckman she talks a lot about yeah. you're familiar with her she talks a lot about you know the body and and i think her um her take on this is like there's never an upper there's never a place where one should mention anything about someone else's body yeah. good or yeah. bad like yeah. you look oh you look so skinny oh you look so big oh like it's that's it's inappropriate like even it's, now like with pregnancy i've been dealing with that because like people like mean they mean well but like they'll be like oh like you look great like you only you know you didn't you didn't gain any like pregnancy weight you just like gained in like but, like talk like oh your face looks skinny and people, I've, people like i'll be like okay like why why are we focusing on my body like I, okay great I, i'm pregnant like that doesn't give you a right to talk about how i look or like somebody i told someone i was pregnant and she was like Oh, I thought you just like gained like some weight after you got married, and I was like, "That's not a normal thing to say." I remember when I, I was at my crazy. I, I was at like my peak, um, my peak weight of like highest. Yeah, nice highest highest weight ever, and someone looked at me and said, "Oh wow, you lost some weight," and the immediate thought that I had was, "So the picture of me in your head is even larger than this," I guess. <laughs> but I think we all have we it's have interesting that we all have people, stories like this. Yeah. I was I was with you once. I was I was like the most. It still hurts me to this day. Like probably when I'm crying to my wife, you know, after I got married, put on some pounds, you know, and like I was somewhere, and a guy comes over to me, like put his hand on my stomach. Yeah, people touch my and, stomach. And he said like he said like ah, oh, got some marriage weight. I, I, I was like, what? Did you just like first of all touch my stomach? <laughs> a grown man. I will put this boot down your throat. Second of all, did you just touch my stomach? <laughs> no, but like it's really like shocking. Yeah. I, and it's interesting because I think we all would all agree that it's never people aren't saying things to be mean or it's not coming no. from a bad place. It's just people somehow think it's okay to say these things. Um, to comment on someone's weight, to comment on another person child another a friend of yours child's way oh i see she lost so much weight she came home from camp like i've heard that a lot like yeah don't just don't say anything and, and in a household as a parent yeah. i i've i've seen there's a lot of awareness around not even using the words fat or skinny yeah mm -hmm. the, there's no reason why a kid growing up six years old seven years yeah. they don't even know that fat skinny they could be healthy i don't know maybe not healthy mm -hmm. but there's no there's no there's no need for fat or skinny i mean the talk before girls go to seminary the worrying that parents do that their girls are going to gain weight in seminary and they tell them like i've i know people who have told their girls too many times like to be careful and and they're worried and yeah it's um <laughs> it's it's again like atara said some people it, it won't impact them at all but the some ones that it will. the ones that it will it's dangerous yeah are you guys able to give me you know, the top 10 do's or don'ts. It's like, you know, we prepared our top 10. <laughs> <laughs> you, just, you, just, you just seem like the people who prepare. Yeah. We pull that out somehow. Well, Ali, you prepared. Uh, we, um, yeah. yeah, we, um, 
before we came on, you know. You don't have a top 10 by any chance, do you? <laughs> Does anybody here have a top 10? Is there a doctor on board with a top 10? We, um, one, of, one of the things we spoke about before coming on the show is like, obviously, you know, hopefully some of the stuff from the interview resonates with people, but we also wanted to, um, we thought and prepared a little bit in terms of like, what are some like real like. People really doesn't resonate with right, like, what are some like, to say. Yeah, exactly. Like, so, so what are some a, like yeah. t- 10 things that you should just like be aware of or think about or. Things like that. So, so. I, I have them, I have them here. I'm gonna okay. read them and you'll Great. and you'll comment on each one. How about that? Perfect. Okay. That's easy. Look at this. Great. Huh. Look at this prep game here. <laughs> looks good. <laughs> look, looks good on me. I just walked into the studio. <laughs> looks good on me, doesn't we're it? Yucky. Amazing. Yeah, we're yuckies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think he was talking about my prep game. <laughs> <laughs> them, of course. Yeah, you're yuckies. Like, They're the ones that prepped you, dude. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So number one, don't ever comment on someone's weight and don't comment on a friend's child's weight. Yeah. yeah. We just we just yeah, talked we, we about cover, that. We covered yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. Number two, don't comment on someone's plate of food or how much or little Ooh. they have on it. Mm. Oh you my take gosh. That one? Oh. You want to take that one? Tara? No, I'll take that one. I'll take that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that one. If you're buying a meal, okay, I'm say, if you're buying a meal. No, this is just my thing. And I'll let, I'll let you have the mic. Okay. <laughs> this is my podcast now. <laughs> and someone says, why is nobody eating? I am not putting away this food. Nobody's getting up until all the food is done. If you're listening to this in your car and you've heard those words, raise your hand. Get both hands off that wheel. No, no, that's your turn. I just have to get yeah. that off my chest. So the time when that was really bad was one of the things that the therapist had me do early on in recovery was have like a ton of friends over for a sleepover, like a Shabbos sleepover, um, which was good for me socially. Like that was, mm-hmm. I'm glad that she made me do that because like it really was fun. But the eating part of that was not fun because my mom like made me like, made the plate for me in the kitchen. Like she like put a ton of food on it, and like they know I'm the girl that doesn't eat. So all of a sudden I come out to sit at the table with like all this food, and then someone's like, "Whoa, Atara! Like you're that's so much food like on your plate. Like you never eat that much." And I was so embarrassed, and I was like so like it was horrible. And I was like, and then like, she didn't know that like I was in recovery. Like she just saw like the girl doesn't eat. All of a sudden it has a whole plate of food. Like what's going on? But, like yeah. don't say anything. Right. Or like it still happens now. Or like. People like will comment at, at, at a kiddish or at a, a wedding where I'm taking tons of food. It's like I want the food; like, it's good. And then they're like, "Whoa! Like you, you eat a lot." And I'm like, "Yeah, like I'm hungry." Like, like some or someone's like, "Oh, I'm so stuffed. I could not. I can't eat the next course." I'm like, "I can." <laughs> like, I'm like, "I can." <laughs> like, yeah. it's just like, why are you commenting on like the amount of food people are eating? It's just like not. It's not, it's not okay. It's not yeah. okay. I want to expand the lens from there, just to a broader topic. I'll notice people at at Kiddush. You mentioned like the scene of of a Kiddush. I'll no, uh, I'll notice at Kiddush someone like really insisting that someone have a shot of of alcohol. And here, make a lachaim. Why? Why not? Like yeah. like really pushing the envelope. Where maybe there's a reason why the person's turning that down right yeah. now. Never ask them twice. Yeah. 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 And they should also give out bigger plates by condition. The small plate business. <laughs> so true. Sure. Is way, a small I take plate. multiple plates. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea, Tara. Like, I'm going with a tall. You have a, you have a carving station. I give one. To, I give. To be honest, I have brought my own plate sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> bigger plates. You I, have. I give it to my hand. husband. I'm like, hold this one. I'm getting another one. <laughs> <laughs> so number three we have here, which I think is a general rule across the board. Don't ask someone if they are pregnant um yeah <laughs> this is not this is beyond even eating disorder this yeah. is you know we've had uh um the the, the family from a time now oh, he's tapping tapping my thigh yeah was that? who was that from the a time the yeah. couple of course the rosens rosens we had the yeah. rosens on and the topic of fertility like never ask anybody if they're pregnant never. makes people think that they're fat also like yeah <laughs> there's never a there's, good there's, there's never no, a good answer it's never it's never a good thing no like either they're struggling fertility and they're not pregnant but some people are asking them or looking at their stomach or something like yeah. that or they're struggling with body image or weight loss or or weight you know gain or whatever it is and you commenting and saying that is is just can be devastating to yeah. someone um we but we like I mentioned, we try to use humor a lot. Um, so when Atara told us she was expecting before, you know, sharing it with others. Oh, it basically, <laughs> basically early on in my pregnancy, someone like assumed I was and like it got spread it and like it was like, spreading around the five towns a little bit. They leaked it? Like it someone like a leak. It was, like, I don't know. <laughs> it was like spreading around the five towns a little bit and people were like finding out and I was like, I don't know how this, whatever, but okay. Um, and then like I 
So we were joking, like, if anyone comes up to me and says, oh, I heard that you're pregnant, I'd be like, okay, like, what medical issues are you dealing with? Like, tell me about your, tell me all about yeah. your personal, like, life. Like, yeah. like, who, like just, don't we, came, ask. we came up with, like, all this, like, funny, like, response lines, probably never use them. But, no. you know, like, at, like if you're going to ask someone a very personal question that's none of your business, maybe we'll ask you one back yeah. <laughs> that you don't want to answer. Like, what medication are you on? Like, so yeah. We will share our, our pregnancy status if you give us your entire medical and mental health history. <laughs> and, and, uh, and financial, of course. <laughs> and how's that eczema, by the way? <laughs> exactly. I was in Camp Pask on Sunday, as you know, and <laughs> I, was, this is, I don't think it was such a personal question as much as it was odd. Someone came over to me and said, so new, are you still married? <laughs> And, and it was like, and I'm like, I said, I, I, mean. I said, actually, no, <laughs> <laughs> she, she left me <laughs> and he, he turned white and I left oh. it and I let it sit for a minute and he almost choked. He, he, Good for you. Yeah, he's like, he's like, what? I'm like, no, I'm kidding. What a dumb question. Are you still married? That's not normal. Are you still married? Right? Right? Thank you. Uh, number four, tone down the talk about dieting oh, yeah. at your family social gatherings. Yeah. I mean, so this is something that, yeah. that, you know, we with support of Gratko, a big takeaway was don't say Amrit Shem by you. Try and fi mm -hmm. find other ways. I'd be very happy if, you know, a good takeaway from an episode like this is you're with your family. Yantav is coming up. Like, how do we eliminate diet talk? Well, Oof, Yantav's if hard, you're right? eating at the table and you think that the cake is unhealthy, don't be like, oh, I can't have it. It's so unhealthy. And like the person next to you is like, now they're feeling bad. <laughs> they're eating the unhealthy cake that you yeah. said is so bad. Like, don't, even if you don't want to eat, okay, keep it to yourself. Like, don't say that's unhealthy or I'm on a diet or like, or people even like will say like their weight at the table. Or they'll say, and like people will say like, like yeah. what they're doing to diet. And like, it's just, it's so bad. Also like kids, they hear all of this. They, you think like your three-year-old does not know, like they know. Yeah. Like if someone's saying it, they will hear it and they pick up on it. Um, so I was really careful. You need, really, need to be really careful. I think like once you guys got more sensitive to it, you guys would like be more careful about it also. But like you also like, yeah, for sure. you mm -hmm. like, we like would like make like these faces at each other whenever somebody would say something like really bad like, at the table. Like, and I'd be like, I'd be like, yeah, mm -hmm. I was, I, I mean, I still am, but, um, I have like a, an immediate like guard that goes up. Like I'm feel very protective of all my children, but very protective of of the challenges that a tires face and so sometimes when i hear something at a shabbos table or something that was innocently said to her i it brings up something for me like yeah. i know she's going to be okay because tara's got you know fantastic tools that you know has gotten her to this point and will continue in her life but for me as a parent it's like why do you have to say that yeah you know why just like why yeah well we have lots of stories of like people said to you people said to me like when during recovery that like people don't know what to say so like they sometimes say the wrong thing. So if you don't know what to say, say nothing. Like oh, that's, like, that's oh, the next fine. one. Perfect. Oh, look at that. I didn't even know that was on the list. Wow. <laughs> I put that one on. It's all right. I like skimmed it. Okay. You know, um, actually, I don't, I don't even know if you know this, Atara, but um, with the protectiveness of your parents, we have, and this is extremely hard to do, um, but it's it's a level of which we felt like we we need to protect you. Like before, like beyond tips or family gatherings and stuff like that, we would sometimes. So if you're listening to this and you're in our family, it's not just you. It's multiple mm. people that we've said. Um, we've gone over to people and requested that certain topics not be spoken about, that things not be said, um, because we knew that it would. That Innoc did not always stop innocently. people. Innocently. Mm. It doesn't always stop people, <laughs> correct? But to the point where we could maybe tell people to think about it a little more before, like hesitate or, and if you and if you made a mistake and you said it, okay, it's okay, but yeah. like maybe... Just try not to do it again. Some things are not meant to say like, out loud. Right. Like some, like you can tell the story about the pocketbook after, but yeah. But, but someone, um, we one of one of one of my relatives, we went out for dinner with them, like during recovery, and like I had to eat, like we got like, like this big sandwich or something. I had to eat it. Like it wasn't like I chose to order that. Um, and they knew me as the, you know, they knew I was going through. It was like my parents had told them, but like they, and they, they, were, they thought they were saying like the right thing, but it was actually the really really wrong thing. And they said like. Oh my gosh, like you ate so much. <laughs> like thing like, oh, like it's like a little kid who like struggles with picky eating and then like they eat and you're like, wow, I'm so proud of you. I'm like, you're telling me I eat so much? Like, I don't want to have eaten so much. Like, and it was like the total opposite thing to have to like say to me. Like, or, like people who say after like I came back from camp and I had gained like 20 pounds, and like people were like, You look so good. You're telling me I gained you told me I gained weight. You're telling me I, I told, like, that's what you're saying. So like, you're saying you're number five, just don't say anything. Like you're saying I gained weight. If you <laughs> tell me I look good, you're telling me I gained weight. Like that's what you're saying. Like I don't that's not helpful. Like that. even though it comes from a good place, it's yeah. still it's the opposite right. of helpful. Yeah. 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 I heard a nice uh, acronym once. Um, 
inviting people to wait. And the acronym is WAIT. Why am I talking? And it's an acronym, so it has to be true. Mm. And WAIT. Why am I talking? That's perfect. About WAIT. WAIT about nice. WAIT. Nice. <laughs> Very yeah. nice. That's not why you said it? No. <laughs> wow. I totally missed that. Interesting. Tyler wanted me to mention the pocketbook story. Sure. <laughs> Just a quick little whatever. This also, like, we we had, you know, very few people who knew, but those who were who did know, there were people that wanted to help, but they didn't know how to help, and they did not at all understand eating disorder. So um, when I was talking to somebody about it, they said they just wanted to be helpful, but they were like, okay, just, just, just tell her that if she, if she eats, I'll, I'll buy her X, Y, and Z. I'll, I'll buy her this. And it just it made me sad because it felt like they really don't understand that it's not about buying her something. If, I, if we could buy something and make it go away, we would have done that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? Like we would have done anything. Um, Again, well-meaning, but um, just offer support. Like, don't, yeah. don't Number make, six, yeah. if you know someone is struggling, don't only say I am here if you need anything, but also do something specific to help. For example, make specific plans to get them out of their house for a little, cook for them, something for dinner. So I'm, I'm assuming this is something that maybe you guys found yeah. throughout this process. Well, like we said, you know, how difficult part of the treatment process was and how intensive it was. I mean, of course it was difficult for you at Tower, but, you know, emotionally and, and time-wise and, you know, so, so much of it needs to be on on the family. So, yeah, definitely when families can can get that support, it's so helpful. Also, like when somebody has a a medical health crisis and everybody knows about it, like a child's sick, God forbid, you know, there's the Hill and WhatsApp groups and yeah. there's meal trains and like people can't do enough for you, which is incredible. I mean, we live in an amazing Jewish community. Mental health. But when it's something yeah. like this, and A, you're not broadcasting it to the world because it's your child's privacy, your family's privacy, but you've told, but even if you've told a few, and if those people you've told can do the slightest thing, like you take you out of the house for a half hour because you're sitting with your child for hours and hours and on, you know, or or take the child themselves out for uh, an outing. Yeah, one of your right? friends did that for me. I don't remember. Leora. Leora. Oh, Leora yeah, would take that's me out. right. My friend took that's you nice. out. Yeah. And and even like just bring a kugel over, bring something over because again, it's time consuming. People don't realize that if you're at home with a child, it's very time consuming. In general, like the specificity of the offer is super helpful, Correct. right? Like, right. let me know how I can help. Puts right. the burden on you to like yeah. figure out what, like find something concrete, specific. Yeah. It's like asking someone, oh, you guys are welcome to come for Shabbos anytime. <laughs> yeah, anytime. How about now? <laughs> How about like tomorrow? I'm free this weekend. <laughs> yeah. Number seven, things aren't always as they appear, so don't be quick to judge others. Sounds like one of the, like a Sarah said, Deborah, no? Yeah. Yeah, Is we it? touched on that a yeah, little we, bit we, in terms of like when people yeah. made that comment, yeah. oh, she must really just want to hang out with you in your cabin. She doesn't like camp so much, you know, like. I think that, yeah, the, the thing is like you, you don't know what's going on. People who are saying you look so skinny and they don't know that I'm not eating or like people who, or people will say like, where were you? Like they don't know what I was, where I was. And like, it was actually not anything they could have thought it was, you know? We, we had, there's the Rosen said, told a story on our podcast about a couple who was supposed to be going upstate to be with their family and they couldn't make it in the end because they needed to go to the hospital for IVF treatment. It had to come out, it came out on a Friday afternoon. They weren't going to make it. But they also, it was a time in which it was and, and you know, the community in which it was, and they couldn't tell the parents, the family, they didn't feel comfortable telling them what they were going for. Yeah. And family members didn't talk to them for months because- And they, they, and they were told, oh, you, you don't even have kids. You should be the first ones there to help. Oh, and and like such a, like it's it, it, from, from the- So devastating. Exactly. It's so heartbreaking. It's like, you don't it know what's is, going on. It's, it's heartbreaking. And, and it's actually like one of the things that, that we learned as parents through this is that you, know, you have to put your nuclear family first. And so um, sometimes that means not going to large family gatherings mm -hmm. because you have to deal with whatever you're dealing with. Um, or it means that maybe that environment is not the best environment at this time for a child. And you have to, you know, say, I can't come yeah. or I need to have say or or I can come, but I need things to be a certain way. Yeah, there were times like I, like when I was in camp for that summer, I couldn't go on like the the teen trip. And like it was like a few days and like, People probably were like so weird. Like, why? I, I mean, for reason, like, oh, I have a family wedding or something. Like, people were like probably thinking, like, oh, she doesn't want to come. Like, but, like that's not the reason I couldn't come because there was there were no supervision for me. But, like, people can be so quick to assume, like, oh, maybe she's just like, like she gets too homesick. That's why she can't go on this trip. Like, they could have thought a million things, but they were not true. Yeah. Yeah. I, remember, I love the idea about the nuclear family 
thing too. It's really hard. Every, every family has dynamics in the extended family. And to the extent people can really, really plug into and focus on their nuclear family, like their immediate yeah. Yeah. nuclear. Yeah, Whose term is and that? And that really, like, by the way, you guys covered- Great term. Is that your term? Nuclear? Nuclear family. Nuclear family it's like, it's your... like the nucleus. Nucleus, yeah. yeah. That we just covered number eight. That was about the about the nuclear, nucle the yeah. nucleus. Nice. Um, number nine. As a working parent, find someone at work to tell about your situation. It can help alleviate some of the stress when you feel you can't perform at your best. That rhymed also, Doctor Seuss. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you go first. Did you did you share with anyone at your work, Danielle? I, I I did. I didn't share with that many people, but I definitely shared with uh with with a few people because the the expectations that are you know placed upon you uh you know definitely you know. You want people to just be understanding and like we're saying to, you know, just support you as you're trying to take care of your family. And I'm sure that was true for you, Hani, as well. Yeah, it was, it was, it took me a little while to figure out. I, I knew that I needed to tell one or two people because I wasn't possibly going to be able to perform at my best right. or what the expectation was of what, how I currently performed. And that was really, really hard. Um, part of it's also like, we place a lot of stress on our ourselves, right? In terms of performance, you know, and, and I remember feeling like I have such tremendous responsibilities at work and people rely on me and I manage people and we're helping community. And, but I found two people, I found two people at work um, who I worked closely with and I just laid it all out and I, and I made it clear, like I may not always be able to answer the phone. I may not be able to answer my email so quickly. Um, and I, it was very supportive, very supportive. In fact, very few people at work knew. Um, and recently, about maybe like a year ago, Danielle, a year ago, one of the people that I told at work called me up and said, listen, there's somebody else uh, within the OU family, within the Yachad family that I think could benefit from talking to you guys. Wow. And had I not told that person, they never would have connected us to that other, you know, other co a colleague who we've spent you know, a number of times talking to and really support them. Number 10 on the list, which I think is so important, is always remind your kids that they should come to you for help. Oh, yeah. This is, this is not just true for Atara, but for all of our children. But, you know, I think what we've always said to you, Atara, even as you're getting married and, you know, entering a new, new phase of life is always come to us. Like, we're your parents. And don't, you know, I know sometimes you would, like, be worried about telling us certain things because you were worried that either we would be worried about you or sad or... Or maybe we wouldn't let you like go and do something. I don't know, whatever it was that you, I mean, you could speak to that, but we, our mantra is just come to us. Um, yeah, I guess it's hard. It's like, it's very traumatic when you're the one who put your parents through something. Um, and you like, didn't put us through anything at that. But I, I did. <laughs> um, is so that like, something that you have, you feel like guilty about? I don't feel guilty anymore. But like at the time, like when you see that you're causing your parents to cry or that making their life fall apart, isn't that's not easy when you know it's your fault? Even though it's not like my fault, I wasn't trying to be like a bad kid. But like you know, it's you're the cause. Like that's a really hard thing to be feeling. So like you don't want to burden them with anything else ever because you, you see what that's what that does. Um. So even like throughout high school, like I was when I had like I run I have relapses. I still sometimes you know have my moments. It's so like, I didn't want to tell them because I'm like, they already went through like Gehenna with me with this once. I'm not telling them them having, I want them to think that I'm totally recovered and I'm good and like nothing's ever going wrong with this ever. Because I think like, I was, I was so worried that they would have such PTSD from like me dealing with it that they wouldn't want to hear about me having any struggles with it. Um, and yeah, so that's, so like an important thing for parents to know, like, is that if you're that, well, if you have a child going through anything like this, like. They are going to have relapses and they're going to have other challenges and you have to make an environment where like they, they can tell you and you're not going to be like, oh my God, like let's go back to the therapist. Like what's happening? Like, I didn't know you, you were struggling. Like, like, like totally freak out. Like you, if you do that, they're not going to want to tell you. They'll be like, I'm not mm -hmm. at that same place. I'm just having a hard time. Like you need to make that environment very safe and not like, because yeah. like then because the the child wants to protect their parents feelings at that point and like that's not help healthy for the child if like you're protecting their parents feelings at the expense of like your own mental health and i love what you're displaying here which is i know the the 10th item was you know instruct your child to to bring the things to you 
but much, much more than the instruction to the child to bring things up is that reframe that you offered Atara when Atara said that. And you're like, this is not something that you did to us. This is not something that you caused to us. That's what you said and, to us very, me very in the beginning. Because I remember like after I got diagnosed, we went in the car and I was like, I'm so sorry. Like I, whatever. And my dad's like, why are you apologizing? Like, it's not your fault. Like it's not something you chose. Yeah. yeah. And that's fostering that environment that you're talking about to create a relationship with children where there's, there's room and there's space for that dialogue, whatever the item and issue might be. Yeah. And as much as I'm, none of us, you know, asked for this for, for sure and could have avoided all that, like the, those dark times. But I, I, I always feel that it's in many ways brought us much closer together. I know I feel it t- towards you, Atara, and I f- for you as well, as we were going through all that, you know, t- together, that it really connected us. And I felt, you know, in terms of uh, Amuna, that it connected me more, more to Hashem, that at least I, I felt like in those, the darkest of times, that was when I felt mo- most connected. And this is a theme that emerges from any of our guests that we speak to that have worked through dark times and gotten to a place where they've emerged into the light. Looking th- back through the lens of that work, the, the, the brightest light can only shine through the darkness. And when you're able to look back on that and see what it, what it did for your relationship with Hashem, what your relationship for each other, that's where you have the ability to express this gratitude. I think for me, I was like too young to like think like that. Like I was just like, hey, this was horrible. Now it's less horrible. Like going to high school, like I wasn't like thinking like, oh, Amuna. Like I wasn't like thinking that way at all. But like definitely like it came like, I guess later on where I was just like, oh, like it's really great. Like I think when everything else started working out for me, like also like when like I went from like feeling like being in this really dark place to like, like being like having lots of friends and then, and you know, like, you know, getting married and like, all the other things that happened for me. Like, then I was like, wow, like everything is coming like together. And I think that's where the Amuna like peace came in. Like that knowing that like, just cause like something bad happens like in your life, like other things, it can turn around. Like, and like, it's like, I would not be able to imagine at all like where I am like right now. And like, I'm being, I'm like teaching in a high school next year. Like I would not have even like imagined that that's where I would have been like then. Like, like it's just, it's crazy. Yeah. The, the last, the last question I have uh, for you, Tara is, this is an episode that you know parents might want to listen to with their kids. They might want their uh, daughters or sons to listen to this episode. If you can speak directly to whether it's the, a girl, a young girl, or a young boy who is struggling with this right now in silence and no one knows about it, what, what would you tell them? Um, that at their own time, they should tell someone, whether it's like, a parent, a friend, a teacher, like whoever they feel comfortable with, um, but that they sh- should know that like it, it feels like they're the only one, but they're really probably really, really not. Just like no one talks about it. Um, and they should know that like it doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't have to like go down this path. Like sometimes you feel like you can't stop. Like you're just going to keep going until it's over. Um, but like it can be reversed and like if you're really at that beginning stage where you can reverse it like put in all the effort that you can but if you really feel like you're beyond control at this point like really try to like reach out for help and like it might feel like the exact opposite thing you want to do but you're not happy right now and like the way to get back to being happy is by doing this thing that you really think you shouldn't be doing which is eating and getting recovery and it feels counterintuitive like your eating disorder is going to tell you like no, don't do this. Like, we don't want to do this, but are you happy right now? Like, are you happy in your knees or you're definitely not happy? You're, you're probably really depressed. Um, so if you actually want to be happy, don't listen to the eating disorder that's saying that this, it'll make you happy once you're at this weight and at this size and whatever, because you're, you're going to keep wanting to go down. It's not going to be happy. Um, and the only way to be actually be happy is to recover and leave lead a more healthy life. Is it okay, if, is it okay if we, sure. say, we each get a chance to Go say some it. things to Atara? So yes. um, back when when things were really bad, um, it was very hard to tell Atara stuff. Like we wanted to like boost her self-esteem. We wanted to tell her how much we love her and all the amazing things that we saw that she couldn't see. So um, I don't know if you remember this, but sometimes I would send you emails because yeah. I knew she couldn't listen. So I was like, I'll just send her an email. <laughs> you know, like, 
You're a Tara. <laughs> you're a Tara. I think you're amazing. You're wonderful. Um, but I feel like um, I'm be I'm, I'll let you speak for yourself, Danielle. But as your mom, I'm extremely proud of you, not just for coming on a podcast today and telling people your story, but just watching you um, face a challenge on a regular basis, but not making it define you, that there are so many incredible things about you, your personality, um, your beautiful inside and out, and um, you're so kind, and you're an amazing friend, and now a shotgun, an amazing shotgun, mm. um, and I'm just really proud to be your mom, and I love you. How to follow that, but pretty much the, they're just the same thing. And I, th I think, I don't know if we could have imagined being here seven years ago and, and saying these things to you, but uh, I would even go so far as to say that maybe what you went through and emerged on the other side of Tower really allowed you to become the person that you are and do the incredible things that you're doing. And we love you so much. And we're just so proud that you're hopefully giving a sense of hope to people who are listening and then facing a similar struggle. <laughs> Gewalt. Yeah. Gewalt. Thank you so much, Herman Zlasky. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Meaningful People podcast. If you'd like to get in touch with Daniel, Khani Herman, or Atara herself, their contact information will be in the description of this episode. And once again, we will be raffling off a Be Kind Spectre to one lucky commenter. In the comments on the YouTube video, you have to make sure you are subscribed and you like this video as well on YouTube, but we will be raffling off a Be Kind sweatshirt to one lucky commenter. So leave a comment. It could be something simple like, oh my gosh, this episode was really inspiring. I really loved it. We'll see it. We'll add you to our raffle and we'll announce the winner on the next episode. But thank you so much for listening. Really, really important content here. Make sure to leave a rating, a review. It helps our podcast be seen by more people. And of course, we will be back at you with another episode of the Meaningful People podcast next week. Can't wait. See you then. Hope you enjoyed this video from Meaningful Minute. We have so much more content for you. You may like this. You may like this. Take your pick. Let us know what you think.